something I'm very passionate about, uh, which is using micro simulation models uh, to estimate the population impact of public health interventions of, on type 2 diabetes. So the way we're going to go about it is, uh, first, we're going to motivate and talk about why we actually need simulation models. And second, we're going to try to show you how to implement it if you were to do it yourself. So why do we need simulation models? All right, so we need to back up a little bit and talk about, in the broader sense, in epidemiology and in science, we're usually very interested in cause and effect. That's taking a medication, reduce my uh, headache, uh, that's taking, that is, uh, would exercising, reduce my risk of cardiovascular disease, that's changing a certain exposure X, reduce uh, or change my outcome Y. And to do so, we need to be able to compare two scenarios. So one, on the one hand, we need to expose uh, you know, a certain individual to a certain exposure and then unexpose them uh, at the same time. I know you might be scratching your head because that's virtually impossible unless you have some time travel. But we could use what we call counterfactual language, basically meaning we need to be able to compare what happens and what would have happened under certain different um, exposure status. But the closest way that we can get to it is by using randomized control trials so that the groups are exchangeable. And, but you know, uh, randomized control, control trials, although they're great, they're the, they're the uh, gold standards, they're not always feasible and practical, and sometimes they're very costly. And as you know, uh, the, uh, the time um, to follow up uh, to follow, uh, uh, patients or the population may not be that long. Uh, and lastly, they're not always generalizable to the population of interest, just because we have so many strict uh, and inclu uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. And so we can use other experimental designs that I'd like to propose to you. Uh, one is quasi-experimental designs, or again, uh, virtual experiments. So quasi-experimental study designs, basically, as, uh, unlike uh, randomized experiments, where the investigator has the ability to control the assignment of interventions, in uh, natural experiments, for example, investigators they do not have uh, the control of the assignment of interventions. They basically find uh, some uh, variability in some policies uh, over time and basically analyze uh, data to be able to come up with certain conclusions. However, uh, as, you, as you can imagine, even that sometimes is not even possible because such policies have not been yet implemented. Um, we, we could use uh, some, something a little closer to that, which is called hypothetical uh, experiments, which we use, for example, like one database uh, in trying to uh, simulate um, a counterfactual uh, exposure. Uh, basically, let's say we have only 30% uh, of children that are breastfed, and we want to know what would happen to the population if 100% of the population were to be breastfed. Uh, as you can imagine, that's an interesting thought. But sometimes there are even some things within that single database that are not possible to uh, access uh, because the data is just restricted to uh, just a few variables. But there's one way that we can actually break away from this. We can use virtual experiments, uh, which is my personal favorite. Basically, we would uh, combine multiple data sources to be able to create a virtual experiment, right? Using national surveys, and in this virtual experiment, this synthetic uh, population, the investigator now has the ability to create a synthetic population where he can run um, different uh, experiments uh, in silico. And so uh, it's important for us to realize that the reason why we're interested in cause and effect is because we want to inform policy decision making, clinical practice, public health. Um, but to do that, we need to be able to use the right tool. And again, as I mentioned, randomized control trials, they have their place. But sometimes they're not uh, sufficient, uh, you know. And uh, um, again, here I'm emphasizing they're not they're not sufficient, but they are complementary with all the tools that we have. Um, we we want to be able to use tools that are able, uh, able to uh, allow us to uh, assess uh, or evaluate an intervention that is run for a very long period of time, or interventions that cannot really practically uh, or ethically be implemented. And so we resort sometimes to micro simulations and simulation models. All right, but I've been talking a lot about micro simulations, but what is a micro simulation model? So as the name implies, micro just means at the individual level, small. Simulation means imitation of a situation or process. Model is just a representation. Sometimes you hear the term used interchangeably as agent-based model, a mathematical model, dynamic model, or general micro simulation. They all mean the same thing. 
uh, and people use it differently, uh, you know, and they have different preferences, different nuances, and for example, interactions with uh, HDS models. And again, in micro simulation, what we want to do is to simulate individual uh, over time and incorporate uh, basically individual characteristics like age and sex. Uh, going back to that idea of randomized control trial, again, we start with a study population and we flip a coin, we assign people to the treated group and to the untreated group, and we follow them over a certain time, a period of time, and then we try to compare and contrast their outcomes. And this is where we get our end uh, Similarly, that's the same way that we would go about doing the uh, uh, simulation model, the computer simulation model. So we would create first our synthetic population using information from surveys, national surveys, and then we would uh, inform this synthetic population, follow and simulate people over a certain period of time, observe the outcomes and contrast them. And that's basically how you get our uh, impact, basically. As you can imagine here, we're able to expose and unexpose the same people. We can do that because it's computer models. All right, when do we use it, right? So we use it mainly in two big categories. The first one is when we test, we want to test assumptions, um, um, you know, especially within the observational purpose. But sometimes we want to use it because we want to intervene, you want to evaluate the effect of particular exposure or interventions. And so going back to that idea of just wanting to observe, imagine we just wanted to see what would happen, um, for example, uh, for a, uh, a new, a novel, uh, uh, for example, coronary disease, uh, uh, you know, pandemic, you know, we can try to do new simulation to see what would happen in time uh, if things were to remain the same. And sometimes we also use a simulation models to be able to integrate and synthesize information from various sources. Uh, but also um, uh, something else that we like to do that uh, I particularly like is, is uh, basically use it to project healthcare needs and to make uh, predictions to inform, uh, let's say Ministry of Health uh, or even the, the, the government so that they can better allocate resources and avoid the wasteful investment on uh, interventions that will not work. And we have the other category of in, uh, interventional purposes when we actually evaluate the impact, uh, meaning the cost effectiveness or even the effectiveness of uh, public health interventions on a given outcome model. You're essentially asking the question, what would happen to a population outcome level if we were to intervene in the exposure? This is basically the current function. And you can think about as a randomized control trials in an artificial settings. Uh, where we can evaluate interventions that cannot be tested in randomized control trials, either ethically or practically. And we can evaluate, uh, we can evaluate in the impact of um, hypothetical interventions uh, before it's actually implemented in real life. Uh, we can explore intended and unintended consequences, and we can also explore the trade-offs among uh, interventions. And this is really uh, important. And then, but as all methods, there are some advantages and some disadvantages. One of the, uh, some of the advantages include that they're faster, they're cheaper, just because they use existing literature, existing data. You don't have to primarily collect the data. They also are flexible because they allow for a long time follow-up over the, for the patient for however long you want. Um, you, they allow to, you to implement in a large real science population. They allow the researcher to also design complex interventions, um, you know, very nuanced, uh, something that you would not necessarily be able to do in real life. Uh, they also allow you to adjust and refine and optimize, basically, interventions. Uh, but as you know, as all methods, they do also have some disadvantages. Um, they require large, large amounts of data, highly computational, very difficult in calibrating, and sometimes they have limited scope uh, for reuse, um, and sometimes they're very complex to implement. All right, so now we're going to switch now that we've talked about why we actually need simulation models, we're going to talk about how we implement micro simulation models. Um, again, this does not, this subscribes to the same scientific method, uh, right? We ask a question, we identify a problem, we ask a question, we, we construct a hypothesis, we conduct the experiment, we draw a conclusion, and we report the results. So same thing. But now the simulation model actually uh, is actually part of the conducting of the experiment, I mean, identifying the method. So how do you actually go about doing that? Well, there are six steps. First, you design the model scope and, uh, and, and, and the model scope, basically. You specify the model, you parameterize the model, you calibrate and validate, and you run an, an experiment, 
and then you you uh, also uh, conduct some sensitive analysis just to test the robustness of your experiment. But we'll go into detail uh, for each of these steps. So first, uh, you need to define the model scope and design it. Uh, first, you need to understand. Uh, you need to be clear about the purpose of the model. What is the goal of the model? What are, what are interventions that are um, uh, that we want to explore? What are the factors that are important and relevant? Um, and again, uh, you want to do it in a manner that involves all the stakeholders, like focus group, panel discussions, such that everyone is involved in in the decision making process. And then now you can draw a causal diagram uh, or, or even uh, a directed uh, asymmetric graph to really incorporate all the the, uh, the ideas that people have talked about. You know, I have here like a, a very brief example, but we'll go later uh, in an example, uh, you know, of the research that I've conducted. All right, so we specify the model, basically define the structure of the model, basically the backbone of the model. You define the attributes, uh, the population size, uh, the social demographics, the age, the sex, uh, the behaviors, and the outcomes that you're interested in. You define what environment you would like this to happen. And most importantly, you have to decide the on the decision rules. Decision rules are really important because if they're wrong, your model is wrong. Same is for the parameters. If they're wrong, the models can be wrong. But again, remember, all models are wrong, but some are useful, right? So again, here, we're gonna be using different rules, such as the ones that are based on regression models, uh, differential equations, or even just conditional statements, if and then. If the condition is true, then do something else, do something else, all right? And then, now we're going to parameterize the model, which means we're going to be assigning real value to the variables that were empty, right? And then to do that, we need to do a systematic literature a search of the literature. We can do peer review. Uh, we can there are many types of of, of uh, level of evidence, right? We could use meta analyses, set systematic reviews, randomized trials, and course studies. Uh, we can also use cross-sectional studies when we don't have, uh, you know, randomized control trials data or even meta-analyses. Uh, sometimes we we might have to analyze internal and out, uh, data or, that are private uh, or public. Um, and the reason that we're calling evidence level three is just because it's data that has not been, you know, research that has not been published on that. All right. So once you, you parameterize it, you need to calibrate it. Basically, that means you need to fine tune it so that you get the right signal that reflects exactly the reality. You could use machine learning algorithm, calibration in the large, and this is, remember, an iterative process. Verify the model as in anything. The last thing you want is to publish a paper and have to realize that instead of a plus sign, you have a negative sign there, right? So you wanna make sure that everything's correct by debugging the code very thoroughly. And now you validate. And again, remember the calibrating and validating is part of the same continuum. Basically and essentially what we want to do is to make sure that the data that we have incorporated in creating our synthetic population is reflective of the real data, right? And we can use different techniques like predictive validity, like comparing the predictive baseline output uh, data to the original data. That's just one example. And then we run our experiment. Uh, again, we could either do it to simulate counterfactual scenarios for comparative effectiveness or cost effectiveness, uh, or we could just do it uh, to go observe a phenomena like forecasting or understanding a mechanism, or just if you want to generate a hypothesis. And lastly, uh, we definitely want to quantify at least the uncertainty because, you know, uh, let's face it, we're not certain about the, the different parameters that we put into the model. So we want to include certain uh, errors, uh, certain uncertainty around parameters, as you can see here. Uh, you know, we have a confidence interval that are surrounding the, uh, the parameters in themselves. And then sometimes we can even uh, decide to go with different model structures just to test to see how uh, best our model could affect reality and tell us the, um, an answer that could be correct at the end, right? And then we, we quantify it by uh, confidence interval.